Yes, I'd like to, I guess, go briefly into a bit more about the book and the and the prophetic nature of the book. So there's the idea of the the Platonic month, as you, as you hinted at, which is which is essentially uh, I forget the the specific astronomy at the current moment. We'll get into it as we get into it, into the book. But basically, what what you need, need to know for now is there will always be a dominant zodiac symbol in the sky, and when yes. when when you when you look up to it, that will be the one, and it will remain in the sky as the dominant zodiac symbol for about two thousand years. And so in 1 AD, we swapped between, it was Aries, wasn't it, into Pisces. Mm -hmm. So it moved into the symbol of the fish in 1 AD. And so that collective energy, as you were saying, that change of ions was focused into the man of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the reasons why the fish is so heavily associated with Christ himself. Now, as you go along and you continue over the approximate 2000 years, what's interesting is astronomers do not know when the specific end of our current Christian ion is going to be. They lost approximately 2000 years. Uh, some have said it ended in like 1960. Some are saying it's ending in 2600. But what Jung picked up on as this ion was moving, it was basically science versus religion. Where, wow. where we are we are the fallen people, but we're trying to slowly pull our way back up to heaven again. And a lot of this is, in order to understand Ion properly, and I would highly recommend you buy this book anyway, you need to understand the story of Faust. You can either go pick Faust, up Chris, yeah. Christopher Marlowe's version, which was the original articulation of the myths and legends that spontaneously started popping up around a guy called Dr. Faustus, who was born in the year 1500 or 1490, somewhere around there. He was like a Christ figure where he was wow. born, and then all these myths and legends started coming up around him. And if you ever heard the story, if you've seen The Simpsons, you would have done, of the guy who is wagering his soul with the devil, this all comes back to Faust. So Christopher Marlowe, who wrote around the same time as Shakespeare, one of Shakespeare's biggest inspirations before he randomly died one day in like a drunken brawl, which is like amazing how some of these visionaries can die. His version of Faust is interesting, but it seems to be most focused in Goethe, writing in the 1700s, I, I, yeah. I do yeah. believe, his particular Faust. And that that symbol seems to be um, what we're going towards, all that satanic energy focused into it. So it's not like Satan worship like you'd think. When people say like the word occult and Satan and things of that nature, they think it's literal bowing down and worshiping the devil. It's not. It's, it's satanic principles, which essentially are the principles of science. And basically what Ion is going to do is walk you through that particular story, project towards a potential future and go really deep into alchemical literature because alchemy yes. is something people like to completely throw away when it yes. wasn't. Science as we know it began in like the 1800s. Like it was called science in the 1800s. But before then there was this alchemical dream, which was more, it, it was science within a dream state. And there were certain things they were looking at and what the alchemist discovered was at odds with what the church interpreted Christ's message as. So there is hope in the alchemical literature for what we can do going forward. And it's absolutely terrifying and it is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I am. Um, oh, shit. I'm getting excited. There's so much to cover now. Like there's so much to cover. There's, um, I guess I guess I'll I'll, I'll I'll leap into astrology briefly and then I will give a extremely hapdash spin of the nature of history like I did in that long form piece of content with the music all that i'll try yes. i'll try i'll try download that really fast and present it but i'll talk a little bit about astrology because um this this is definitely a bone of contention for people like you drop the the a bomb in any uh like intellectual circle and they'll be like right people i am bowing out now all smiles that was fun it was cool to talk about stuff but you brought you astrology no thanks like I'm, mm. I'm off that's off the table here now i think astrology is uh justifiably criticized quite a lot because people reduce it down to horoscopes and whatnot, but the 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 framework which with which which the the, the way astrology was originally used was way more contextual and so we say collective like the babylonians didn't have a sense of what we call individualism that is a very very recent idea the babylonians used to <laughs> they used to look at the king they actually they started astrology as a way of predicting what we're talking about here what's going on in the kind of collective mind especially what's going on with the weather because it makes so much logical sense it's like all right you look up you see the stars and they move almost like a clock so you're like all right that's a clock all right and then and then you start projecting onto it it's like the weather's up there as well and the weather has to do with whether we survive because we have food or we die so mm -hmm. then you've got a sense of destiny starting to get the layered into that as well and then after a while they would start to do this idea of the the king and his choices are somewhat related to 
the destiny of the the people too of of the civilization as well so they would start to say okay well when a certain king is born oh yeah and layer in obviously all this emotional stuff we're talking about with the the meme world when a certain person is born in the context of of whatever astrological assimilation here means something and then you get this certain type of king and he's going to do a certain type of th type of king, uh, thing and whatnot so the king becomes this like the only thing that matters and people do horoscopes for him and then over a long period of time people are projecting all of their history onto the stars like this is another this is another huge thing you've got to take into account is that people didn't write and so in order to store their memories almost like and um, the way that you have the desktop and then you have all those folders what what the what, the way your memory works is it's very associative like you, you will stick up a stick up a symbol and like we're talking about ion now and so all these ideas are rushing to us from this specific sphere it's not like we're talking about shoes and then we're getting mm -hmm. all the information we have about shoes and so you have this desktop and you have like a folder and it's full of all these ideas about whatever and then you open that folder up and all these ideas flood back out because they're oral they would have used the stars to do that and they would project the gods or these collective ideas up onto the stars so like a, a constellation of um the capricorn for example they would store in it the myth of capricorn and all the ideas of capricorn and so every time you would be a sailor there and you're smoking your proto cigarette kind of thinking to yourself about what's going on in the world you would look up at the 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 thing of capricorn and you would download that myth and it was like a giant way of storing the the memory of a culture it literally was the collective mind projected onto the world and so this is in essence a really primitive version of the collective unconscious and so this is how like so what happens then is you get this story where you're storing all these ideas and then you also get this conception of time mixed in with that and so you're kind of thinking to yourself right so we came from here and these are all the patterns that are currently in play where are we going and then that leads you to the logical conclusion that um the stars and their kind of cycle or how these patterns play themselves out and whatever way we've projected onto these patterns if we project them right they will give us a, a sort of insight into what direction we're going and that leads us on to and i think that is the 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 crucial root of astrology that people need to understand is that it was coming from that perspective not from this idea of like oh you were born with mars in whatever place it is now so therefore you're going to be like angry on tuesdays it's like mm. that's that's like a very very castrated version of what they're trying to do and um and, and so holding that in mind holding that very complex and and deeply historical idea in mind i, I think we should get into the idea of uh, morality and good and evil because the the way we evolved and i'm reading the genealogy of morals right now and it's just so applicable to this it's astounding like the way we evolved was not to think morally the way we consider moral now like christianity was is an absolute and non like a historical anomaly it just makes no sense to us whatsoever the idea that the poor should be treated nice the idea that uh everybody in the world is equal the idea that god cares about everybody in the world is just absolutely absurd considering where we came from like back in the day with babylon and rome and these super civilizations that were based on dominance and being the biggest dog the biggest gorilla in the jungle shall we say that the morality of these places was about racial superiority and strength and like i think i've said this before alexander the great when he died he would they asked him who will take your kingship alexander it's a very greek way of thinking who would take your kingship and he said may it go to the strongest so there's this there's this cult this and, and cults like his worship and you also worship your premier value the premier value was strength beauty life these type of things but the problem is is that weakness was considered evil not um, shall we say cruelty now in mo modern day world we consider cruelty evil but back then it would they would have considered weakness they would have looked at a homeless person like i'm making this simpler than it is but they would have looked like a, at a homeless person and said oh you're pathetic they would have looked at a, a weak feeble person and said you're just fucking pathetic it's your fault it's disgusting life has not favored you and it's probably because there's something wrong with you maybe your soul is corrupt or something like that and so that that that's very much in alignment with the idea of Ares. That, that was the the kind of god of Rome. I think this is such an important thing to bring up as well. Is that it's not trivial that um, Romans considered themselves sons of Mars, and Mars was the Roman version of the Greek god Ares, mm -hmm. and Ares was the astrological symbol of the ram, and the ram was the god 
of that age of that ion where Rome rose up and took over the world. And uh, the ram is also the symbol of Pan and Pan is the symbol of Satan, the horned God. Like that's just utterly that's so difficult to dismiss as something like that. It's just unbelievable. What the fuck is going on there? Mm. Uh, sir, any thoughts? Uh, yes, I have, I have many, many, many thoughts. I think perhaps uh, to break down morality and particularly Nietzsche's critique of morality, because Nietzsche, again, he was he an absolute visionary in what he was doing and one of the most unparalleled people at looking into the past and mapping patterns and, and his particular critique of Christian morality. No, not necessarily critique of Christian morality, but his critique of of the church and the way they had bastardized it because he actually had great respect for Christ. He thought Christ was the only other person who was intellectually worthy of him, which is very strange considering wow, that, really? that uh, yeah, that, that's what he said in one of his later works, which is really interesting considering that, that Christ didn't write anything himself. We don't really know anything about a historical Christ. It doesn't seem to be particularly important. And the New Testament is absolutely tiny. So I find that absolutely fascinating that all this stuff can surround such a tiny map stuff. I think I think we should flesh this out properly in another full episode on actually the history of morality before we get into it. But apart from that, I think this has been uh, I think we've covered the beginning of Ion perfectly. So that okay. so that so so give, give a brief rundown of what this particular uh, body of work does. The stuff we've been talking about to hype it up regarding the the stars um, is talked about, I guess, sort of midway through the book and everything builds up to it. But also what Ion does like effortlessly. And the, the funny thing about this book is like Jung was an old, crusty man. He was like 70 something when he wrote this book. And um, yeah. and he, he just recovered from like a really bad sickness. And, and he didn't really give a shit anymore. He, he was like, right, I'm not like dumbing this down for the lay person. You get up to my level. So every single sentence within Ion is like is like like this little stick of dynamite, and you yeah. have to sort of sit there with an encyclopedia. I imagine the readers in the fifties with an encyclopedia going going through it. Um, so it starts off with a crash course in the psyche. So it, yes. it, it begins with what you are, what you exist at. Within a few pages, you're like, oh, I didn't know that before. But the, the funny thing about these ideas is they just make so much sense naturally because the way mm -hmm. our minds. Like, here's a really good question to sort of ask anyone who's listening to this is, does the unconscious exist? Because it's something that we, I suppose, take for granted. And, and so if you say, okay, yes, the unconscious exists, we access it through dreams. So, okay, what's the nature of the unconscious? And we go, well, we don't know. It's like, well, mm -hmm. Jung knew and the stuff mm -hmm. and the nature mm -hmm. of the unconscious is absolutely terrifying. And he, and he starts like a crash course on that sort of bring you along and then boom expands it open but i think we i think we've covered the introduction to, to to this book a nice overview pretty well today 